quit building everything as a Power Apps Canvas app because that's what you know, right? I'm guilty of it. I love Power Apps Canvas apps. I'm awesome at them, so I try to build everything as them. But in reality, the Power Platform is full of a bunch of different tools. And so the fact that we're not familiar with what those tools are good and not good for really is a challenge for a lot of us. So this video is to solve that problem. We're gonna go through all the different types of Power Apps, all the different types of Power Automates. We're gonna go through Power Pages, Power BI. We're gonna talk about Microsoft Forms for a second. We're even gonna cover Power Virtual Agents. I mean, Copilot Studio, whatever, right? We're gonna to try to put all that stuff into the context of why it's important to you and how you can build better business apps by understanding all the solutions of the Power Platform instead of just being razor focused on Canvas apps. We're gonna do all that by showing you lots of examples and keep in mind as we go through this stuff, like, yes, if you have a team of ninjas and crazy people, like you might be able to find caveats and workarounds, right? But all my general guidance is coming from the standpoint of, hey, you just want to have a foundational knowledge. And we as a company have built thousands of apps and reports and power pages and all those stuff. And we just know the common use cases we see and the common mistakes we're seeing. That's what drove this video. So don't overthink it. Don't be like, oh, but I know that that's a little bit different, Shane. You probably do. It's okay. Also keep in mind that, you know, I'm gonna kind of mention licensing along the way. I'll say, hey, this needs premium licensing to do X or Y, but we're not gonna get into those details. We're happy to help you with those. You can leave comments, I can chime in on that. You can contact us at powerapps911.com for that. But the licensing conversation will just take us down to me, Rob. So that's enough of the blah, blah, blah. Let's just switch over to my desktop and take a look. Okay, so let's start what we know, right? The idea here is that we wanna jump over here to make.powerapps.com. And from this place, right, we know we can do lots of stuff. But what I really want to dive into is you click on create. I feel like this experience still articulates it the best. And you click on blank app, you're going to see that there's three different things here, right? So these are the three different products that are power apps, which I think is a major point of confusion for people. Like, I know what power apps. And I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, what do you know about power pages? Like, well, I don't know that, right? What a lot of times it really is, is I know Canvas apps, or I know model driven apps, or I know power pages, right? They are three distinct products, even though they all fall under the umbrella of power apps. I'm very guilty of this. Usually when I say Power Apps, I mean Canvas Apps. But in reality, they're three different products. So Canvas Apps. This is where we all like to start. For most of us, we get a free usage of this through our Microsoft 365 or Office 365, whatever they call it this week, subscriptions. And so we can build those custom apps. Now, generally speaking, I think of Canvas Apps as they are great when we want to talk to a wide range of data sources, right? We've got in the Power Platform like 1,200-ish data sources today. So we can talk to everything from, you know, the Office 365 stuff like SharePoint and Exchange all the way through SQL and Oracle and Azure and YouTube and Twitter. And I mean, like, they're just, everything is out there. SAP, custom APIs. There is literally 1,200 different connectors. So Canvas apps are really great because they can interact with all of those data sources without you having to jump through a lot of hoops. And typically what we're building here is we're building small apps that are, you know, for taking in information, maybe editing that information, maybe searching, filtering, and then saving that information, right? Like working with information. Oftentimes when people are looking for ways to start with these, I'm like, hey, go find an Excel-based process today where you pass around an Excel spreadsheet and turn that into an app. Now keep in mind, like we all started these small apps, but we have seen power apps that have literally cost a million dollars to build, right? Like power apps can become very large, very scalable. We have this whole concept of no cliffs where we can introduce the custom developers in there if we want to start adding our own controls, interacting with third-party services that aren't in that 1200 that are available, right? There's a lot that we can do there. Now, typically speaking, we think of Canvas apps as targeting internal use cases, right? So like here at Power Apps 901, we've built our CRM system on Power Apps. We've built our timesheet on Power Apps. I use a lot of automation, like for working with my university students through Power Apps. We use it to kind of build custom solutions to solve internal problems. Technically speaking, Power Apps, Canvas Apps can be used as external. It's possible it's not a great use case. It just becomes a little wonky donkey because, you know, those external scenarios, well, they've got to have an account, they've got to have a license, and who's managing all those pieces. You know, if you come to me and say, hey, I want to build something that's going to be externally facing for a large external audience, a lot of times we're not going to go the Canvas app route. Now we have, right? Like one of our customers uses it with all of the, their clients uh, throughout the region where they want to do a bunch of ordering and stuff, right? Or they're kind of taking orders through it. But it's a, still a controlled list. They know who the people are, right? They're all named accounts. And then they're using some of that pay-as-you-go licensing. So there are external scenarios, but when you're jumping off here, think about this as an internal tool. Next up in the middle there, we have model-driven apps. 
So model-driven apps, these are something that is kind of an offshoot from Dynamics 365. If you know the whole history of Power Platform, you know we kind of evolved from the Dynamics world. And so model-driven apps, if you have familiar with Dynamics, are gonna feel very familiar to you. But these are apps that you can quickly build, and I, I call them forms over data. So they can do a lot of the same things that we saw in the Canvas app. You know, we can filter, search, look at the data. One of the key differences though is that model-driven apps are only built on top of Dataverse. And instead of starting with that blank white screen where you go through and you kind of assemble all the pieces, right? Like in the Canvas app, if I want something there, I literally have to add it, build it, customize it, do it myself. With model-driven apps, you basically say, hey, here's my Dataverse tables I want to add. You know, it understands the relationships, it understands all that. And then you say, okay, I want to use the form that comes with that. I want to use the view. I want to use the charts, right? All of that's kind of built at the Dataverse level. So building a model-driven app is really just kind of a bunch of checkboxes. Hey, click this, 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 this boom, it spits you out an app, making it very powerful, right? If you're on this, it can create you an app in an instant. One of the challenges though is with model-driven apps, they are not easily customizable. So if you want to make it do things that it doesn't want to do, sometimes you just can't. Sometimes you can get someone that knows things like JavaScript to get them to kind of write some crazy customizations. Like it gets a little complicated pretty quick. But if the core thing does what you want, it is super powerful. Keep in mind that the licensing that you have with your Microsoft 365 does not typically include model-driven apps, so you're going to need additional licensing for that. Now, if you're a Dynamics customer, you might have the licensing. Also, the same way that we didn't think that Canvas apps were very good for external entities, model-driven apps. Also, not ideal if your, your use case is, I want to work with a bunch of people all over, right? They're typically internally focused apps. The third one that shows up over here, Power Pages, right? So whereas we think of Canvas apps and model-driven apps as apps, right? So business solutions that are appified. Power Pages, it's a website, right? Like I love, love that we put the word website there. And that's what it's going to be. It's going to be for you to build a website. It can be internally facing. It could be externally facing, right? So we keep talking about if you want to work with people outside, it's a great way to do it. Or it can even be anonymous. So you can, in theory, or not in theory, if you want, you can even build your public website on Power Pages. I don't know anyone's doing that but it is a full tool for building websites. Now, these websites are going to be backed by Dataverse, once again, right? And they are covered under a different licensing, but for the most part, the licensing works one of two ways. Either it's, if you want only use it internally, then you can buy Power Apps internal licenses, named users, that type of stuff. Or if you want to use it externally, then you're going to just pay for the usage, right? So you can pay for the number of calls, number of page views, that type of stuff, right? So it's a much more interesting solution. Like when you want to build something that's public fully facing, maybe you're trying to collect information from applicants or you're trying to, you know, do some type of thing where, you know, you want people to come in, create an account because it also supports not only just, you know, our Azure AD accounts, like all the other two tools did, but it can do its own authentication. It could use Facebook or Google authentication, Microsoft accounts. It has a lot of different flexibility around authentication. It's truly a platform for building websites. Now, I will say that they say, hey, create a no-code website. That is true. You can technically create this thing with no code. I would say that every single customer that we have built one of these for, we have had to you know, use a pro dev, right? We've had to do Liquid or I forget TypeScript, like a bunch of Devi like code languages to really get the customizations we need. So yes, you can build it without code, but Every production implementation I know of ended up using some pro code to really make it do what they wanted. Okay, so that sums up the different types of power apps, right? So there's actually three of these. Now, you will see that Microsoft continues to try to do what they call convergence. They're trying to kind of get this so it's less three products. But here, as I stand at the end of 2023, they are three distinct products, three distinct licensing, three distinct tool sets, right? Just because I am awesome at Canvas apps, doesn't make me anything at Power Pages, right? Like I, I barely know my way through Power Pages. Model driven apps and Canvas apps, they are a little bit closer. They're starting to get closer to being converged. So my Canvas app skills kind of transfer a little bit there, but still they are different tools, different customizations. And so I want you to kind of see that, you know, they're, they're different options, but reality, you should be familiar and be able to at least articulate you through the three. All right, so next up, I want to take a quick little sidestep out of the Power Platform for a second, right? So if we go over here, this is forms.microsoft.com. Once again, this comes with your Microsoft 365 subscriptions typically. And the reason I point this out is because no, it's not part of the Power Platform, 
But a lot of times we use this as a way to get that external data, right? So if you're thinking about getting stuff from the outside, we just talked about the different ramifications of those tools. Sometimes we just want one-way information and we need to get it into the system. So for us, for example, if you go over to powerapps91.com and then you go here to our um, you know, careers and then you apply. So our app job application process is actually a Microsoft form, okay? Because all we want from an applicant is them to get this information, but we need it into one of our business systems. So they come in here, they use Microsoft Forms, and it's a lot like SurveyMonkey, right? Like you come in, you say what different types of questions you want, uh, you know, how, what, where are the answers gonna be structured, how long are they, are they required, you can do branching. No, we're not trying to teach you Microsoft Forms right now, but it's a good way to get information in, because then when this information gets filled in, someone adds an applicant here, when they do this, it then triggers a Power Automate flow, which we'll learn about in just a second. And so that cloud flow then takes the information from here, stores it into SharePoint Online for us, and then it takes and notifies us. It says, hey, we've got a new applicant. And so then the right people can start to review. And then our business process of you know, reviewing applications, interviewing, all of that is facilitated with the data stored in SharePoint. Okay, So keep that in mind. If getting external information one way is all you're trying to do, Forms is a great solution. So we personally use it here. We've got customers that do it for onboarding new clients. They send them this. The uh, client puts in all the information. That triggers that cloud flow. That cloud flow says, hey, were you expecting Susie to fill out this uh, onboarding? I was. You hit approve. And then it starts the process of creating Susie, the accounts, sending her the documentation, the contracts, all of that. We automated all of that. But because we can make this purely anonymous and available on the web to anyone, it's a great way for us to get information in to then kick off the business processes we need. So just a little side note here, but Microsoft Forms is sometimes the answer to your external problems. Hey, if you're starting to feel overwhelmed from all these tools that we're running through, remember over at training.powerapps911.com, we've got the Power Platform University. There was a six month immersive program. It has a mentor, it has hands-on projects, it has live classes, on-demand classes. It is a all encompassing thing that is going to teach you all the different facets of the Power Platform to make you a more effective worker when it comes to using all these solutions. So don't go this alone. If you really are watching this, you're overwhelmed, don't worry, I got a training class that can help you for that. Just go check it out over at training.powerapps911.com. Switching gears over here to Power Automate, right? So make.powerautomate.com. And so here, if we do the same type of thing, we go to create, we're gonna see that there's like six buttons up here at the top. In reality, I think of this as three things, right? So these first four, these are all cloud flows. Cloud flows are your traditional workflows, right? I wanna have some type of trigger. So when something changes, like when I get an email, when a file changes, when an item gets deleted, or on a schedule. So every day at 8 a.m., the last day of the month, the first day of the month, every half hour, or when someone presses a button, whether it's a physical button or a uh, virtual button like a power app, right? Someone triggers it, but there's some type of trigger that says, hey, run an automation, do a workflow. So we trigger it, and then we have one or more actions, and actions are where we go and interact with one of those 1,200 data sources we already talked about. So maybe it's, hey, when someone sends me an email with this, then log it into Teams, and then take the attachment and upload it to SharePoint. Or when someone presses a button, create me a PDF, go hit this third-party uh, subscription service so we get the user API to pull in data, supplement that, and then take that and distribute that to everyone, right? Those are the type of workflow automation. So if you've done like SharePoint designer workflows in the past or any type of just, you know, we have a way to trigger it, cause it to start, and then run. That's what cloud flows are, and that's what those first four buttons really do is they create you a Power Automate cloud flow. Cloud flows are great because the same way that Canvas apps came with your Microsoft 365 subscription, cloud flows interacting with the Office 365, Microsoft 365 ecosystem, those are also included. So we see customers building hundreds of these to do all types of those backend automation processes they want to have take place. Now, if you start to want to stretch the boundaries, you can get into scenarios where you need premium licensing. That could be because you're doing a lot of scale or you want to interact with a custom data source, right? There's both premium data sources, standard data sources, and custom data sources. So premium and custom, those are both gonna require premium licensing to interact with those. Um, you know, when you think about these, like when it comes to internal versus external people, like I don't think of it that way at all. It can definitely send things to external. You can be triggered from external. 
So like these, I don't really think of the same way as we did with the Power Apps where you're worried about internal or external. These are really just about automating business processes. Let machines be, do what machines are good at and add some automation into your world. Okay, next up we have the desktop flows. So desktop flows are a newcomer. Um, so desktop flows, as you can guess, they are workflows that run on a local machine, right? So I think of them running on my PC. For the most part, they are included if you just wanna write a desktop flow that runs on your PC and just interacts with your PC, that is included with your Windows licensing in a lot of cases. Desktop flows are part of what is called RPA, robotic process automation, like things like UiPath, you know, those type of vendors where you wanna take and you wanna automate a process on the desktop that maybe doesn't have an API. So for example, like we've seen people use it to log into legacy systems. You know, it says, hey, log in here, log in there, and then go to screen six, then go to screen 12, and then type in the invoice number, and then whatever's over on this part of the screen, grab that out, and then capture that into an Excel file, send me an email, log it, do something with it, right? So automating those repetitive desktop-based tasks. If you think back to the old days of like, you know, macros, right? Recording, that's what it is, a screen, it can be, a screen recorder that emulates your clicks on a local PC. Now with desktop flows, we talk about they're kind of included if it's just in your desktop, but if you wanna start triggering these with cloud flows, having them interact with larger business systems, or you want to have these hosted so they're not just running on Shane's literal PC, like I wanna have them running on a hosted PC, Microsoft's got additional licensing options there. There's a lot of really interesting scenarios here though, especially those of you that have legacy systems that there's not an API, but you need a way to programmatically get the data out. Like I used it one time to click a button for me 64 times. I wrote another one that would take an image that I would attach to it through a dialog box, and then it would open up my image editing tool, it would grab the whole thing, and then whatever text I put in that same dialog box, it would write it on the image, save the image for me, and then upload it to my file store, right? Like there's a lot of cool personal automation you can do, and system business automation if you start to get into some of those premium licenses with this. Lastly, over here on the far right, we've got process mining. Process mining, this is the ability to look at a process, right? So if you wanted to say, like, remember operations management, if you ever did any of that, like, you know, you take raw inputs and like, what is the process that's gotta go through in the factory to become a, a widget? And so, you know, we know that like it had to go from, you know, here, it got to this station, to this station, we had to kind of move them around. And so what process mining does is you can show it the logging of that type of stuff and it can say, hey, here's what your process looks like. Here's where the bottlenecks are. Here's the average runtime. Oh, you wanna speed things up? Remove this piece of the puzzle or optimize this workstation, right? And so I always think of it in the factory context, but it can work with your invoice history. So if you wanna have it help you with your accounts payable and trying to move things through the old accounts payable or accounts receivable processes better, you can use it for that. Basically, any type of structured process where it under where you can show it like, hey, this is where we're at in the process, this is when it got here, this is when it leaves here, and this is where it goes. If you have a data set that is like that, it can, you know, you just give it the data set and it's gonna build out the mappings, it's gonna build out all the visuals. Like it it really is just like, hey, here's my fields, boop, and all the stuff you're seeing will happen. So process mining, it does have its own licensing. It's its own critter. I, I've not done a lot with it, honestly. Like, I mean, we've done it for one client. I've played with it enough to kind of be dangerous with it. Uh, we've got some people here that know a lot more about it than I do. But it, it's still one that hasn't really taken off. But it is a pretty interesting tool if you've got those structured processes you want to visualize, find the bottlenecks. So there you go. That's the Power Automate uh, tools. Right, one of the things to keep in mind is that, you know, just like Power Apps, right, there, basically there's three distinct tools here. So the way that you do things, the language you use, the tooling that you use between these three tools, they are different. So it's once again, Power Automate's the umbrella, but there's really three separate products in here. And while, as I told you on the Canvas app and model, like Microsoft's kind of converging more of this, we're not seeing converging here, right? We're, I mean, I'm sure at some point, maybe in the future, but really it's cloud flows, desktop flows, process mining. They're just three different tool sets to solve the different business needs you might have. So now that we've talked about how to, you know, build an app to work with your data, how to automate your data, now you want to visualize your data. And that's going to be Power BI, right? We can do visualizations over in Power Apps, right? Like I've made some there and they always just feel like, eh, you know, I did it. But if you truly are looking to build visual dashboards, reports, interact, slice, dice, that type of stuff, Power BI is going to be the right tool for you. Now, Power BI is free if you wanna build reports for yourself, right? You can use this Power BI desktop, you sign in, you can build a report, 
pull in your data, do all your things and run it here. No, no problems, right? The thing with Power BI is that you start to look at sharing data, having uh, reports ran on schedules, all of those type of really cool, like actual business scenarios, right? Because it's different if you can build reports because you want to share it with a bunch of people. All of those are going to require different licensing. There are some of those licenses are included with that E5 level with the uh, Microsoft 365, but once again, we're not going to get into the details. Either way, just think about that. Power BI, we can build them for free, but as we start to get them out, we're going to have to get a little bit into licensing. Now, what you're going to do with Power BI is when you're in here, you can start to build out visualization. So you're going to pull in data, you can transform the data, clean up the data, which is often the hardest part of the projects. And they've got all these different visuals for slicing and dicing and making the data dynamic. Power BI can also talk to a lot of different data sources. It can have static data sets. It can have them on demand. It can have, you know, ones that run on schedules. There's a lot of really interesting stuff you can do here, but this is one of those key elements. A lot of times like when we start talking about building the app to pull in all that information about our manufacturing process, right? And then we're building, you know, Power Automates to facilitate all that working through. Now the last step of that project is typically going to be, hey, we want to be able to visualize it, right? The executives don't want to work with it. They just want to see what you did. And so typically you're going to use Power BI in those scenarios. Also, you're going to see they're using the Microsoft Fabric name in here more and more, like so it's kind of transforming. But while it's not as direct as Power Apps and Power Automate, which are like, you know, real close in the same product, Power BI is in the family um, and it should be part of your business solutions. Also keep in mind that it's the only one that has a desktop product like this that we're actually using to build and then you publish it to the web and then that's where you start getting the sharing, the interconnectivity you can build out there. But a lot of times you're gonna start with Power BI on the desktop and then push it out to the Power BI on the web or Power BI on the cloud, I don't know, whatever we wanna call that. Last but not least, we have Power Virtual Agents or that's what it was called a month ago. Now we call it Copilot Studio, right? So Power Virtual Agents, which is part of the Power Platform, evolved into Copilot Studio. So everything you could do with PVA can now be done inside Copilot Studio. And what you're primarily going to be doing today is you're going to be building chatbots, right? And so the same way that I can go chat with ChatGPT or Bing Chat, I can build a bot here that I can chat with. It can also use generative AI so we can take it and say, hey, I want you to get information from the, this SharePoint site, right? Or get the, from this website. So we can pull in information and instead of building topics, like so typically when you think of a chatbot, you're like, all right, if I want to be able to say, you know, what is a shark? So I would have to go make a question, a topic for that. What is a shark? That'd be my trigger phrase. And then down here, I would fill in, here's the details of what a shark is. So if you want to ask it, it would trigger that topic and it would go. Now what I can do is just feed it a bunch of content about animals and then not create a topic. And so then the idea is when I say, Tell me what you know about sharks. It would say, well, there's no topic for that. So then let me look in the data set. Oh, look, there's information about sharks in there. It'll pull it out and cite that information. Very helpful ways to build more robust bots, right? So the same way we can build GPTs over in ChatGPT, we're going to build co-pilots here to do this chatting. But not only can we do the generative answers, we still can also create those topics. So in one of the demos I did this week, I had an HR bot. And so that HR bot was really pulling generative information in, but then I said, okay, but if they say how much PTO do I have, I had a specific topic for that that would then take their uh, user ID, go look into my data source, look up their amount of information and respond back because I could integrate a Power Automate flow. So the chat bot here, it's doing generative stuff, it's doing hard coded stuff, but those hard coded topics can even use Power Automate to call custom actions to go and get information and provide it back. Or another one we did for a customer, they were using it for IT help desk. So you kind of did your troubleshooting here. If the bot couldn't help you, then you could say, create me a ticket. And then it would just trigger that flow action that would create them a ticket in service. Now, boom, they were off and running. So they didn't have to go to another system to create a ticket. And then they had the chat information as well. So a lot of really cool stuff you can do. Copilot Studio is becoming more and more important as Microsoft rolls out more copilots when, you know, Microsoft 365 copilot rolls out. You're going to be able to use Copilot Studio to customize it. So even though this doesn't really seem like it's part of the Power Platform today, it is. It came from us. It still does a lot of things for us. And it's a chance for us to evolve into that Copilot story. Whew, I don't know about you guys, but that was a lot, right? Hopefully, though, this gives you an idea that, man, there's a lot of different tools out there. We're not just a one-trick pony here. If you really want to be good at this whole low-code, no-code thing, you've got to understand the difference between Power Apps and the different ones there, the Power Automates, 
Where does Power Pages plug in? Where does Power BI come in? Can I build a chatbot to just facilitate this whole conversation? Would Microsoft Forms augment my whole solution so I don't have to worry about going too wide, right? There's so many tools here. So by watching this video, hopefully it's got you grounded on what is possible with each one. So you can start to say, hey, I have an interest. I have a need for that. Let's go explore it. If you have questions or comments, leave them below. I always use those to kind of figure out what those future videos are going to be. Or if you're just like, man, Shane, I really need more help with this stuff. I need help planning our businesses rolling out of the Power Platform or which one of these tools to use. Hit us up over at powerapps911.com, right? We've got all types of consulting services, mentoring services. We got training classes. We can help you with this if that's really one of the challenges you have. And with that, I'm going to say thanks and have a great day.